grace and peace, everybody. I'm so glad that you're joining us once again on Bridging the Gap. Again, this is Bridging the Gap podcast. It's aired on Apple Podcasts, Spotify. You can watch us on YouTube as well. And this week, I have a special guest, a friend. I've known him for a little while, but you know, just the connection that he has in this community. I want to welcome to my my guest for the very first time, Pastor. Jeff Mosier. He currently lives in Muncie, Indiana, where he's wearing many hats in this beautiful community. Pastor Jeff, thank you for joining us today on this week's podcast episode. Hey, it's great to be here, really. Well, it's an honor to have you. I always like to try to diversify. I'm going to say bigger words here today that uh, my audience with different people, I want them to see different perspectives, what's going on in the community they're not, not even aware of. And so, Pastor Jeff, let's give a little insight to the viewers that are listening and watching right now about your story. Now, I know that you are currently pastoring a church right now, and you are also the face, I call it, of FCA, Fellowship of Christian Athletes in East Central Indiana. Talk to us a little bit about where your journey all began and how God called you into this ministry. Okay. Well, Man, uh, how, how many hours do we have? Well, let's let's go with about 30 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> you could share a lot. Uh, I, I just really was impressed to share a little bit about my mm-hmm. initial testimony of coming to Christ as Savior. Um, I wasn't raised in a church home at all. Um, you know, my family were, my parents were moral centers. You know, they weren't mm-hmm. out robbing banks sure. necessarily, uh, but uh, they weren't walking with Jesus. Mm-hmm. And... Um, uh, you know, I, I became a, a Christ follower at age 12. Um, I was just a little sinner, a little heathen, mm-hmm. and getting ready to go out and getting some sin. And a guy came knocking on my door on a Saturday morning. I was the only one there and uh, invited me to come to their church, ride their church bus. And I was like, no, thank you. Uh, but, uh, but he just kept every question, every resistance, every objection I gave, he gently had an answer mm-hmm. for and after a few minutes, I thought, in, in my brain, I was saying, okay, I'll go to your church, you know, but uh, in my heart, I was going, hmm, yeah. So anyway, uh, after three weeks of hearing the gospel preached, mm-hmm. uh, every week I would be more and more convicted, and I had a major profanity problem as a 12-year-old, oh, wow. uh, uncontrollable. I didn't know that. I just thought that's how you talked. Right. And uh, the Holy Spirit started convicting me, and I thought, this is not cool. i got to stop talking like that. And I tried and tried and tried, couldn't. And on the third Sunday, when they preached the gospel, gave an invitation to surrender to Christ, I just went up, and the pastor prayed with me. I'm just bawling my eyes mm-hmm. out. I said, man, I didn't know the right words to say, but, man, I'm, I, I need God. I've got problems. You know, I need, I, need, I need help. So he led me in a prayer to commit my life to Christ, and then— uh, I'll never forget this, and this may be for someone listening. He said, uh, you know, if you've got some things you want God to do in your life, just you just talk to him yourself for a few minutes. It just left me there. And so I, in my own way, I don't know how exactly I said it, but I said, I can't control this profanity problem. God, can you help me? Can you, can you take this away from mm. me? And instantly, deliverance, absolute deliverance. I didn't know that terminology. Didn't know that it was a spirit, but it was a spirit of profanity, I'm sure. Sure. And and, and the Lord set me free, completely free. Transformation. Four years before I slipped and said a bad word, uh, and it was a drastic change. That is awesome. So I went back to school, middle school, started telling everybody about Jesus, and went to... uh, one guy I knew that was a church kid, you know, and I would, thought he'd be excited, and he was kind of like, okay. And I thought, well, that's not what I expected. But uh, started sharing <laughs> Jesus. You know, this is during the Jesus movement. Sure. I didn't know that at that time. It was about a year or two before I realized that there was a movement going on. And uh, so I'm passing out tracts, telling people about Jesus at school, and had the privilege of... Uh, you know, hearing the Holy Spirit's voice in the middle of class one time, seventh grade, okay. to witness to this person. Now they're a pastor's wife, serving Jesus, oh, wow. being used by God. Uh, I mean, just all kinds of stories. And um, the thing that came to my mind earlier as I was thinking about what to share, I don't know if anyone's seen the movie Woodlawn, but in 1973, yeah. we were living that here. Yeah. Um, my end of my eighth grade year and my freshman year, you know, we had some race rides. Mm-hmm. 
And uh, this young lady that I'd witnessed to that had become a Christian, we're walking out of the field house, and there were some people ready to start a race riot. Mm -hmm. And they were just going to grab the first two coming out of the field house and pummel them and get the thing going. Well, we didn't know that. We're just walking out of a basketball game one night, wow. right? And here's this big 19-year-old dude, and he grabs me, and he hauls his arm back. He's getting ready to pop me in the face and start the riot. Somebody grabbed my friend. A girl grabbed my friend. Start. He went to swing. Somebody stopped his arm. He said, no, man, he's cool. And it was a guy I'd been sharing the gospel with in my gym oh, class. Wow. It was his little brother. <laughs> it was my age. And uh, uh, my friend got pummeled, but I got delivered. <laughs> and... Uh, <laughs> But we had, you know, we had so many things happening there yeah. at the time. So anyway, that was my early beginnings. Um, and then call to ministry in general happened two years later at 14. And really, literally, it was almost an audible call wow. um, during a church service. And this was in a Baptist church, which that typically doesn't happen, that sort no, of thing, except mm. for in spirit-filled churches. But, um, but uh but anyway, uh, the Lord just literally spoke and confirmed it and made it, made it very, very clear. And uh, that same year, I met my wife at age okay. 14. We were together ever since uh, until she went home to be with Jesus a few years ago. But, mm -hmm. uh, but anyway, uh, that was such an awesome time. And I, and I say that because things were upheaval, 69, mm -hmm. 70, 71, 72. And guess what? Things haven't changed a whole lot. Yeah. So being a Christ follower today is just like it was back then, sure. man. It's all about following God and being led by Him. But that's my initial okay. initial call to ministry was back yeah. then and started pursuing it and being used in it. Yeah. Well, I know you're a part of FCA. Could you talk a little bit about what that's all about? There may sure. be viewers right now that have heard, and I think me and you shared before the session, uh, it's called Fellowship of Christian Athletes. And most kids I've had ask me, do you have to be an athlete to be a part of this program? Talk about, number one, just tell us a little bit about FCA and what that's all about. Sure. And, and, and to, to try to keep it brief, uh, back in 1954, 53, okay. actually, 52, 53, there was a gentleman who was giving a vision, given a vision. Mm -hmm. And he would find articles and magazines about a, an athlete sharing their faith. Yeah. He was impressed by the Holy Spirit to clip those articles out, stick them in a drawer. Didn't know why. Had no idea why. Mm. This happened over a period of years. It wasn't very common to see that. Yeah. And one day he was impressed by the Holy Spirit to get those seven articles out and lay them on his desk and pray over them. And as he got, well, there were more than seven, but there were seven specific ones. He gets them out, he's praying over them. And the Holy Spirit said, I want you to go talk to those men and ask them one question. Would you be willing to use your platform of influence as an yeah. athlete to share your faith in Christ? So when I share this, Nate, with young people, I say, so he got out his laptop and he Googled them and he got their email addresses and he wrote them an email and he said, hey, I want to ask you this question. And the kids are sitting there nodding like, uh-huh. <laughs> no, this is happened. 1952, <laughs> man. The dude hocked his car. Oh, wow. He hocked his car, took out a loan on his car to buy the gas, to drive all over the country to find these men and ask them that question. One of them still alive. Two, actually, two of them are still alive. One's right here in this area, Carl Erskine, good friend of mine. And he tells the story how when Don McClannan asked him that question. Wow. And from there, he met Branch Rickey, the mm -hmm. uh, manager of the Dodgers, okay. Jackie Robinson. Yeah. Branch Rickey was a man of God. God told him to bring Jackie Robinson up. Wow. And one of the other things God told him to do was start this thing called Fellowship of Christian Athletes. Wow. And so, anyway, that's when it began. It's, it's grown. It's, it's morphed. It's changed. But it's an evangelistic organization where we do have that principle where athletes can use that platform of influence to share the gospel of Jesus yeah. Christ. So it's developed into, in our area, a campus ministry where we have campus groups. The student leaders in those groups really are usually athletes, but you don't have to be an athlete. We call it Fellowship of Christian Antibodies. We want to bring Christians together from the Methodist Presbyterian churches in the area because they're all in that church, they're all in that school. Mm -hmm. And we can bring them together, man, and just build a, a community of believers on that campus that then not only impact that campus, but as we've been seeing for the last 12 years, impact the whole community. Yeah. And so that's uh, that's basically the the the, uh, the the premise 
uh, we do have uh, some team team Bible studies mm-hmm. with athletes, specifically with athletes. For example, at Ball State University, we now have FCA there. That is athletic specific. Okay. That yeah. is just for college athletes. They have a different lifestyle. Sure, sure. And they they really need that fellowship. Uh, to encourage each other in their faith in that realm that they that they find themselves. So, so how did you get involved? Did somebody seek after you? You seek after them? How, how did that all come yeah. about? Well, again, back at Muncie Central, 1973, okay. moved into the brand new building. Okay, mm-hmm. my kids go, what brand new building? It was brand new in 1973, <laughs> man. Right. And uh, so, anyway, when we moved into that building, brand new building, brand new principal, uh, who was a Christian. In his first staff meeting, he said, uh, hey, every place I've been, we've had a fellowship of Christian athletes. I'd like to have one here. And the track coach, Jim Lambert, said, I felt God poking me in the ribs. And so we launched FCA when I was a freshman at Muncie Central. And then the ministry kind of died out in this area of the state in the 1980s, mid-80s, late 80s. And uh, so... Myself personally, I was my youngest two were Christian athletes at Yorktown. Um, so in 2008, uh, they graduated in 2009. Mm-hmm. Um, we got a new superintendent at Yorktown who was a Christian. Said the same thing my principal said when he met with Kelly Whitman, the principal at Yorktown. Said, "Hey, we've always had an FCA every place I've been." Uh, really love to see something like that here. And they began to talk. And Kelly asked me, I was announcing a football game. And she said, would anyone in here like to start an FCA huddle? And I said, are you talking to me? She said, yes, I'm talking to you. <laughs> and we did. We started it there, and it blew up. Wow. Uh, we had our first evening event. We had over 100 kids show up. The gospel was presented. Um, great, great time, great student leadership. And then... From there, I asked the state director, hey, are there other opportunities to serve? And uh, I'd been doing mission work in other countries in the summer and preaching healing crusades and evangelistic crusades in other countries in the summer and then working Mm full-time 11 months out of the year. And uh, so we met, and he said, uh, (laughs) uh, yeah, there's, you know, we— we have been praying over East Central Indiana. It's a big black hole. There were only four schools that had FCA. Oh, wow. So um, he said, we've been praying. He said, matter of fact, the day I called him, he said, matter of fact, our staff today in our prayer meeting, we were praying over East Central Indiana, Indiana that God would raise someone up to lead the ministry. Mm-hmm. He said, how soon can we talk? And so we met, we talked, and I said, well, I'll volunteer. I'll just volunteer, and we'll see what God does. And uh, within a year, we had 12 huddles in just Delaware County, I think, and um, 12 in the area, and then it just kept growing from there. Mm. Um, and then as he did this, Nate, this is a big turning point for the, for the ministry and the impact. Uh, the very first meeting, he opened his laptop, and there was this picture of this big crowd. Mm-hmm. And, and I said, whoa, 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 I stopped him. I said, whoa, 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 what's that right there? He said, that is our evangelistic outreach called Fields of Faith. It's an evangelistic crusade, usually done outside on a football field. I said, I don't know. That's what I've been doing in other countries. I said, we're doing that. And I had no idea I was prophesying, you know, Mm. that that would be the largest Christian event here in East Central Indiana now for 12 years. And um, so that first year it launched, we thought we'd have 500 people show up. I mean, the max. Yeah, right. The max. We had over 2,500 people awesome. the very first year. Uh, dozens came to know Christ. So that has been our biggest community sure. outreach for sure. Sure. Yeah. That's awesome. I know Fields of Faith. I've been to a lot of them since I've been back in Muncie. And so I know you were the one that uh, kind of brought in Tim Tebow a few years back. Mm-hmm. And man, you guys packed out the university arena. How many people would you say were at that event? The official attendance from more than was 6,000. Yeah. We were hoping for 10,000, but uh, 6,000 is still a bunch I'd of I'd say that's a lot. That's <laughs> probably more than the basketball team brings in. So. Uh, yeah, I think so. <laughs> so that's great. So so what were you doing prior to FCA? Was you a pastor somewhere? Was you a leader somewhere? Were you just working a nine-to-five job? Yeah, I had, I had different things throughout my career. I got called at age 14, got married at 18. We started having kids, and we didn't stop. We had eight. Mm-hmm. And uh, so during sure. those years, I was working in factories, working construction. We're talking about in the 80s, mm-hmm. um, all through the 80s. And uh, uh, 
ministering every ch chance that I get. Never, and, and again, this may be for somebody. I just was sharing this with someone who since they had a call in their life, but yet they're stuck taking care of their kids and sure. taking them to soccer games, and they're, you know, they're not in ministry, but yet they know they've got this calling. Sure. Yeah. Well, I live that way. I yeah. mean, that's where I was. I'm in a factory. I'm witnessing on the job. I'm sharing the gospel on the job. But I knew I had a call to full-time ministry. Never, ever did I question that ever for a moment. Mm -hmm. um, so we did that. We lived in northern Indiana for a number of years, part of a ministry up there. When we moved back to Muncie, I had my own business at that time. It was a um, re reconditioning business, okay. a liquidation business, and we did that for a number of years. Anyway, the, then I... Uh, began working with Culligan Water, did that for a number of years. And I always used to say, Nate, uh, if someone feels like they're just in a job and they're not in ministry, that's wrong. If mm -hmm. you're a Christian, you're in ministry 24-7, all, all those opportunities. I used to say I go into people's homes as the Culligan man in disguise as the Culligan man to share the gospel. Amen. And I could tell you testimonies. One of the most miraculous supernatural events that I've ever seen, I saw a physical transformation of a human being. It was on a Culligan call. Wow. Absolutely. And the person got born again, and they, they physically transformed before our eyes. And this was sitting at their kitchen table when they're buying a water softener from me. Wow. And we began to share the gospel. And uh, their heart was broken, and they came to know Christ. And physical transformation took place. Wow. And they continued to follow Christ the rest of their life. Um, so that's what I was doing. And then in 2011, uh, the demand with FCA got so strong. Um, my youngest two were in college at that time. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was then time for me to be in full-time ministry. Wow. And I never questioned that that would happen, just didn't know when. And so if there's someone that maybe has sensed a call and they – are getting discouraged yeah. because they don't have the little church with the white picket fence out front, and they, you know, right. they don't have that. I sat and took, I sat and take took notes from our pastor for, you know, years preparing, praying. So anyway, that's great. Yeah. So I know you're pastoring as well right now. Yeah. This is kind of a funny story I want you to share, but uh, I know you took on a position over at Shawnee Heights. I'm not sure how many years ago. Tell us a little bit about that yeah. story and how that all transpired into what it is today. Yeah, and really it was in, in conjunction with FCA through what was going on in the community. Um, the, there were two, there were three families in that church that were all connected with that. One family had lost a son in a tragedy. Uh, we had uh, we lost six students in eight weeks oh one my. summer, and the Lord impressed us to do some ministry to those families with FCA. And uh, through that, um, got to know one of these families, and one of those families were at Shawnee Heights. And the pastor decided to retire. Um, they were really not affiliated with any denomination. There's a name on it, but they really weren't affiliated. And so they just called me up and said, Jeff, you know, we don't have a clue. The pastor's leaving. He gave us a one-week notice. He's leaving. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, you know, could you come in and preach for a few weeks? And I said, absolutely, I'll come in, fill the pulpit. And then we began to talk. And I said, well, don't you, how do you, you don't you have some connections or whatever? And they asked me if I would stay for a little while and help them. And I said, well, you got to understand something. The sign out there says Baptist, okay? I was saved in a Baptist church, but we got to talk about a few things here. Because, <laughs> you know, I believe in the whole Bible, the, the, the gifts of the Spirit, laying hands on the sick, seeing the dead raised. I believe all that. I've yeah. seen it. I've seen it. You know, and I said, you know, is that going to be a problem? And these people looked at me and said, Brother, we don't care. As long as it's in the Word of God, you preach it to us. Mm. And I said, Well, now we can talk about that. Let's get ready. <laughs> and so the church grew mm. from about 100 people down to about 30. That's a good growth. <laughs> uh, it's, it's good wrong, growth. That's the wrong way, but yeah, in some sense. Go yeah. Ahead, go ahead. yeah, it was good growth. The, the people who left were the ones who weren't hungry for the word mm. they were the ones that just wanted to argue and backbite and fight and sure. all that stuff and that didn't last very long because we just kept preaching the word and so they decided they'd go someplace else and take their fighting with them and there mm. you go so now we've got a group of people there that love each other and um, they're growing in the word and it's only been eight years those three weeks have now turned into eight years three weeks is eight years yeah Wow. Yeah. And uh, so we're, we're really thankful for that opportunity. 
Uh, it's a beautiful building. It's a beautiful facility. Yeah, and uh, we were able to hold Fields of Faith last year there during mm. the pandemic. I remember that. Um, the max amount of people that you could have in the state of Indiana gathering was 250. Mm-hmm. But God, God gave us written permission to gather 1,000 people wow. for Fields of Faith. And uh, so uh, what an honor, what a, what a privilege that, that the is. health department, and they said, yeah, we trust what you're doing. So, wow. yeah, Shawnee Heights has been a great opportunity. We're trusting God to do great things. Well, now God is, I know he's using you in a mighty way through FCA, Fields of Faith, and even at your church at uh, Shawnee Heights. And now give us some testimonies. You just kind of talked about one that was during a colleague in time, but Give me a couple of testimonies or just a testimony, if that's all you have, that you have witnessed that were just life changing while you have been involved in that ministry. Sure. Uh, man, I could go on and on and on. Uh, one of the greatest things, Nate, when, that I get to hear is when we bring the Fields of Faith team together, we just do a call out with the huddles. Mm-hmm. You know, hey, huddle coaches, if you've got some kids that you believe would be good to speak in front of this audience or that are musicians or vocalists, um, and we do a call-out. So we get them all in the room, you know. It's yeah. a six-week commitment. And uh, they don't know what I'm going to do, except for the veterans that have, you know, been sure. on the team for a few years. So all you new folks, why don't you stand up, give us your name, and tell us your testimony. And before the big event we did with Tim Tebow, uh, we had a room full of people there that wanted to be on the team. And one after another after another got up, Nate, and they said, yeah, my name is so-and-so from so-and-so high school or middle school. And uh, I would tell them to tell us how they began their journey as a Christ follower. Well, I just wanted to share that, uh, you know, they would say, I went to Fields of Faith two years ago. Mm-hmm. And that's when I gave my life to Christ. Wow. And now I want to be on that stage leading others to Christ. And then another, and then another, and another one. Yeah, I went to FCA camp. I was invited by a friend, gave my life to Christ. So what God was showing me was that he's, he's allowing me to see just a little bit of that fruit wow, that's in awesome. their lives. Uh, we had uh, two dyslexic twin brothers from Yorktown. Mm-hmm. Uh, they'd been going to FCA all middle school. They never spoke one syllable. They would come in sat down. We have 100, 125 kids every week at Yorktown Middle School. They'd come in and sit down in the front row. I had no idea that they had a major mental uh, handicap. Uh, They talk like robots when they do talk. Mm -hmm. Very slow, very hard to understand. Uh, They can't remember what they learned six months ago, except for with some memory tricks. Uh, Great challenges for them. So they, they, they sat there the whole time in middle school. We go to the high school. We had about 12 to 20 in the high school group. They'd come every week, come in and sit down, never say a word. Mm. You could engage them in conversation sure. afterwards, but they would talk like a robot. And, and I found that they could text, though, Nate. Mm. And so one winter, we're texting back and forth, and John Perry uh, texts me, and he said, Coach, I think it's my turn to share the devotion in FCA. I just started balling. I'm going, oh, my goodness, the dude's never said a word in five years wow. as he's sophomore now, uh-huh. and he wants to share the devotion. So we got together, talked about it. He came in, had a PowerPoint presentation, a Christian music wow. video, uh, and everyone in the room was very patient um, in that group. At that particular time, we had a lot of special needs kids coming in for donuts and stuff before school for FCA. And there was a very, very, very uh, special needs young lady in the back row. Uh, We'd have discussions, and she'd start talking about ponies or something, you know. Mm -hmm. She and she raised her hand after John shared. She said, "Hey, I I think I can do that." And so she shared the next week. Wow! I mean, he impacted other lives. The next summer, before school starts, he texts me. And he said, Coach, God keeps waking me up the last three nights. God keeps waking me up with dreams that I'm supposed to speak at Fields mm-hmm. of Faith. I started bawling. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. Here's a kid who can't speak who's going to get up and speak. And, uh, and he did. He got up and shared a message. It was powerful. There wasn't a dry eye in the house. Uh, now he and his brother are at Indiana Westland studying to go wow. into youth ministry. Man, that's awesome. 
<laughs> now let me ask you, you said 11 years you've been doing Fields of Faith or 12 years? 12 years, yeah. In those 12 years, how many people would you say have been one to the Lord or you made the declaration, I'm gonna, I want to give my heart to Jesus? Yeah. Um, boy, that's a tough question. Um, that is a really tough you question. You can give me a rough ballpark. Yeah. Um, you know, if we said 50 every year, that would be a conservative number. Okay. Yeah. Wow. I mean, obviously the Tebow event. Oh my goodness. Sure. We we've got there's there's guys and there's a young man that got saved that night that's in full time ministry now oh uh, with you with Union Chapel. I mean, his life is totally transformed. Wow. They've been working with him, mentoring him. Uh, yeah, and I mean, testimony after testimony. So that night there were a lot. Yeah, I remember uh, that night. Yeah, there's a lot of people that went forth. So or come forth. That's it. Well, I know that. Well, let's just base it off that six hundred people. If you go off twelve or fifty times twelve, my math's right. Yeah, I'm, so, I was figured low. Uh, yeah, but, but that's yeah. an amazing just right there. That's an amazing thing. Well, here's my last question as we close out this episode of podcast. Uh, I ask this question weekly, or uh, the first time I have my guest on here, and the question simply is, where do you see yourself in this ministry going in the next five years? Mm-hmm. And that is a great question. It, it's a um, it's a challenge for me because I'm a nose to the grindstone person, sure. and and I, I rarely look up and look five years <laughs> down the road because I'm so busy and yeah, immersed sure. in what I'm doing, and it's something I need people to help mm-hmm. me do. Um, with the way our culture is changing, in reality, we we operate on a public school campus under what's called the Equal Access mm-hmm. Equal Access Act, and mm-hmm. I won't go into all that, but as long as it's student initiated, student led with adult state staff supervision, students have the freedom to have any kind of club that they want to. Uh, Whether we think it's a good or bad club, they have that right. It's a public building. And so that's what we operate under. Uh, In all reality, we have no reason to believe that that will be in in effect in just a few years. Mm -hmm. So in all reality, um, the East Coast and the West Coast campuses have gone to what are called closed campuses where they don't allow any student groups at all oh wow uh, if they allow one they have to allow everyone everything right so if they say we don't allow any there's only one school system in indiana that has gone that direction thus far wow. but we know that that's coming so to answer your question um, fca we have to be wise and begin planning um, other forms of campus or non-campus athletic ministry so uh, we're really wanting to dive into club sports uh, okay there are FCA ministries around the country now um, that are just really immersed in the club sports world, and that's something we're that's developing right now. Yeah. Uh, it's not govern- regulated by the government. That's right, yeah. Um, so we really desire to get uh, you know, uh, at facilities that have tournaments every Sunday. Sure. You know there's half of your youth aren't there on Sunday exactly because right. they're playing a softball tournament, wrestling, yeah. basketball, whatever. Volleyball, whatever out there. Yeah. Yeah. So they're not coming to church, and the families feel guilty. I'll be honest with you, the parents feel guilty. Sure. They know they should be under the Word of God, but they're out watching Junior play softball or yeah. whatever. So we want to provide chapel services at those facilities where we can share the gospel and have a 30-minute. So we've got to start developing that. So that's the next step with okay. FCA is club sports ministry. Well, that's exciting. I think there's a big, big market for that. Yeah. Um, I mean, just from friends that I know and children that's been in our youth group, I mean, thousands will come out to that Muncie volleyball stuff and their tournaments they go to. So that would be a huge harvest yeah. to go after. Well, Pastor Jeff, I appreciate you coming in yeah, man, man. and giving gracing us with here. your time and spirit that you have. You blessed me. I mean, just listening to some of the testimonies and, you know, encouraging words that you had towards somebody. So I appreciate you for taking your time. And, and we want to join. We want you to join us next week again on Bridging the Gap. I'll have my friend once more, once again, Jeff Mosier. And we're going to talk about a topic simply on outreach. So we'll see you next week. God bless.